thanks a lot. Um, it's really great to be here. Um, it's great to talk about Venezuela um, at this moment. Um, you know, we are just a few days from the inauguration of Joseph Biden as the new president of the United States. I'd like to reflect on that as well. First, I'd like to say that today is the 60th anniversary of the assassination of Patrice Lumumba and two of his comrades. Um, tomorrow is the assassination of uh, Amilka Cabral of the PAIGC. Uh, both Lumumba and Cabral were great tall trees of the African national liberation struggle, both Marxists, socialists, great leaders uh, for us, both cut down by intelligence services of the West. We should never forget how imperialism constantly tries to undermine the ability of ordinary people to make history in our name. Uh, they use all kinds of mechanisms. And what we see today being done to Venezuela um, is in a direct line uh, from the assassination of Lumumba, the overthrow of the government of Kwame Nkrumah in 1966, the assassination of Cabral in 73, um, the assassination of Thomas Sankara in 87, the assassination of Chris Hani and onwards. Uh, it's a direct line from the murder of these very significant leaders of the movement on the African continent. It's a direct line from that to the attempt to overthrow the Bolivarian revolution in Venezuela. So today is Lumumba Day. We honor 17th of January every year as Lumumba Day, a day to remember um, the great contribution, the legacy, and what could have been in Africa had this socialist not been killed brutally by the Belgian state uh, with the CIA behind them at the age of 36. So in honor of Patrice Lumumba, I'm going to present to you Venezuela versus hybrid war. Venezuela has been facing a hybrid war, an imperialist challenge since the election victory of Hugo Chavez and the movement of socialism um, in 1998. At that time, uh, Chavez uh, led this left alliance to a historic victory. Um, and subsequent to the 1998 presidential election, there have been 26 elections um, in Venezuela in the last 21 odd years. An enormous number of elections for constituent assemblies, local body elections, and so on. So highly democratic uh, culture being produced in Venezuela. Um, you got to understand something that when we talk about democracy, we're not just talking about the uh, ability to vote and so on. The United States formally is a democracy. But money power has corrupted the process. The media has corrupted the process. And the legacies of disenfranchisement, you know, uh, that came out of the, the institution of slavery, legacies of disenfranchisement, which were attempted to be undermined by the Voting Rights Act, which was essentially repealed by the U.S. Supreme Court in the uh, in 2013, um, this demonstrates that the institutions of democracy are themselves part of a class struggle. Um, democracy isn't something that you have or not have. Democracy is a battlefield in the class struggle, and you can see this in the in the story in the United States how democracy is a battle of the class struggle. Um, you get money power, as I said, media power, and then that history of disenfranchisement, corrupting democracy, and the attempt of ordinary people to stand up and say, no, these institutions are ours. In the same way in Venezuela, from 1998, from that historical presidential election onward, there has been a process to produce democracy in the world. Democracy, as I said, is not a thing. It's a process. And in that process has been the class struggle. Now, what we've seen since 1998 is the emergence of what we consider to be the Bolivarian project. The government of Hugo Chavez inherited a very complicated and unequal society, major oil exporter, a major oil exporter, but a very unequal society. The ruling elites in Venezuela didn't just all get on planes and boats and zip off to Miami. They stayed to engage the class struggle. Um, Hugo Chavez's movement uh, took a line position against this bourgeoisie. Uh, they tried to deepen democracy in a socialist direction. And that battle continues and has not uh, you know, been foreclosed 
by any coup attempt by the United States. That battle on the other side has not been uh, won by the people. It continues till today, um, you know, uh, two decades after that election victory. But each of these electoral contests has been the ability, has shown the ability of the Venezuelan people to develop their own democratic principles, to deepen democratic institutions, both in the ballot box, but also through institutions such as the communas, the earlier the missions and so on, deepening a socialist, a proletarian democracy. That was part, always part of the agenda. When Mr. Chavez came to power, it was clear that he needed to tackle the question of Venezuela's resources. Uh, from the discovery of oil now about 100 years ago, Venezuela's economy has been just you know, distorted by its massive reliance upon oil um, exports, uh, utilization of foreign, foreign currency as a consequence of sale of the oil um, for importing a vast amount of goods. This distorted Venezuela's social development as it distorted the social development of many, many countries around the world that are oil exporters. Um, uh, Chavez, from the early days, tried to chart a fantastically interesting development agenda for Venezuela. On the one side, to take control of the oil resources, he had to fight against um, the oil companies, but also to take control of other resources, you know, other mineable resources. He had to battle um, mining companies, including you know, 60% of the world's mining companies are domiciled in Canada, including Canadian mining, mining companies like um, the Barrick Gold Company led by then Peter Monk and so on. I'm going to come back to Canada toward the end. Um, so he had to take, he had to engage with these resource extraction companies, the mining companies, the oil companies and so on to get Venezuela a better deal. By the way, this is exactly what Petris Lumumba promised in 1959 at a press conference in New York when he was there for a UN meeting. He said the resources in the Congo are the resources of the Congolese people, not of the Belgians. We will do with it as we wished. And that is why they killed him. The mining companies in of Belgium provided the killers with the sulfuric acid with which they um, dissolved Lum, Patrice Lumumba's body. Please don't ever forget that. The mining companies provided the sulfuric acid uh, to the killers. So the issue for Chavez was we've got to take control of our resources. We've got to drive not a socialist nationalism, but a social, uh, not, a, not a, a resource nationalism, but a resource socialism. That has to be the policy. So he directly confronted multinational corporations right from the beginning. He, 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 he suggested that the, um, you know, the investor uh, settlement mechanisms that are based in Europe, that are based in the World Bank, these needed to be set aside. This is exactly the same policy, by the way, followed by Evo Morales Aima in Bolivia. Resource socialist policy they said, we can't deal with these so-called settlement dispute agencies that are dominated by Europeans and by North Americans. We've got to have our own agenda. And they made enemies immediately of big extractive companies. Um, in fact, Peter Monk of Barrick Gold took to the Toronto newspapers to start describing Hugo Chavez as a dictator, as authoritarian. The only authoritarian action Chavez took was an authoritarian action for the people against big capital, particularly against Peter Monk's Barrick Gold. Chavez had won one election after the other. There was no evidence of any non-democratic process in Chavez's political career. And yet that was the shameless way in which Peter Monk described him in a major Canadian newspaper. The editors there didn't say, well, let's fact check this. You know, if we fact check anything, we'll discover, uh, Mr. Monk, that Chavez won an election, whereas you never won any election. You just happen to be the head of a major mining company. So, I mean, the first thing I want to put on was put up there is this idea that Chavez comes in with a democratic election to deepen the democratic process. And he comes in and he says we have to drive a resource socialist agenda. The resources that Venezuela gets from sale of its various, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, from its various uh, products that it, it is able to generate, particularly oil, the resources that Venezuela gets uh, will then be utilized at least in three different axes. But I'm going to focus on two of them. On the first, 
immediate improvement of the condition of people's lives any socialist project any left government has to immediately put resources into helping people's lives so they created a series of missions you know whose task was to improve health care improve nutrition improve women's rights improve the situation of young people produce housing um, they produced a process that allowed uh, people who had no proper housing to say look we're going to take this abandoned land and we with some government resources are going to build our own homes on it and i visited many of these housing developments and the extraordinarily powerful places of proletarian democracy where ordinary people uh, utilize some modest resources from the state to produce a, a way for them to better their own lives so the first part of the bolivarian agenda very important was to use the resources from um, you know the sale of things like oil and to drive an agenda to deepen democracy deepen democracy not just in the political sense but the social and the economic sense so that's the first part of the very powerful agenda of bolivarianism the second part of the agenda was chavez was extraordinarily aware that venezuela should not import food that its vulnerability to exporting goods collecting foreign exchange and then using that foreign exchange for basic things such as food um, leaves venezuela vulnerable to attack so the second aspect of the bolivarian agenda was to try to reverse the rural urban uh, movement of, of people and to in a way reconstruct agriculture in venezuela uh, too much was being imported especially things like pasta but even basic things soap and so on imported no need let's try to develop an, an agenda uh, to produce it either internally or i'll come in the third point regionally um, so it's very important to pay attention to the fact that uh, in 1999 itself the chavez administration was seized of the importance of food security uh, you know, uh, of food sovereignty, of bringing some diversification to the Venezuelan economy. Um, it was, they were given no time to do this. You know, e in a way, even the USSR um, in 1917, uh, even though they fought off a direct attack, they had some more time to develop the industry inside the USSR and so on. Venezuela, they were attacked immediately. Uh, there was no time to really diversify the economy. The third part of the Bolivarian project, which is so significant, is uh, Chavez and his, uh, you know, uh, his, 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 his government realized that you can't do this project within the confines of Venezuela. It has to be a regional project because you have to know that you will confront an attack from imperialism. So the third part was the Bolivarian project in the continent to take the vision of what was happening in Venezuela from Argentina and Chile all the way up um, at least to Mexico, if not further north of Mexico, at least to Mexico and through the Caribbean. And this then becomes the front line where Chavez, Morales and others will lead a fight against the free trade areas agreement of the Americas. This is the agreement pushed by the U.S. Treasury Department with the Canadians and so on. They're able to defeat the free trade areas of the Americas a project and they put in its place ALBA. Um, now, this is the Bolivarian area of the Americas project, which is a socialist project with a different attitude towards regional trade. You know, none of these projects, neither um, the MAS project in Bolivia, nor now the PSUV project in Venezuela, the Bolivarian revolution, none of these projects are narrowly nationalist. They are regionalist because they understand the necessity to socialize labor on a continental level to take advantage of each other's advantages you know not necessarily everybody has to do everything uh, so they had a regional perspective this included the creation of a regional digital currency the sucre to reconcile cross-border trade it included the bank of the south it included telesur and so on a host of projects many of them funded by the the boom of commodity prices in the early years of the chavez um, administration so these are the three main aspects of the Bolivarian revolution that I wanted to put on the table. One is using the um, resources from a socialist uh, attitude towards the sale of your resources, using them to improve the immediate lives of people, health, housing, education, women's rights, and so on. 
secondly uh, to try and diversify the economy but mainly to think about food sovereignty key aspect change the grain consumption of people from you know uh, non-complicated grains like wheat to complex grains that can be grown in amazonia and so on that used to be eaten by people but then you know you fall prey to the um, vision that this is what one must eat it's part of eurocentrism but also to these simple carbohydrates that are able to be moved across vast distances of the global um, food commodity chain and you know he, the idea was to break that and the third aspect is regionalism all of this was a decided threat um, to us power and we'll come to that in a minute um, it's important to recognize that what chavez had had pushed was not merely um, a project for venezuela it was not merely a project even for the south american caribbean latin american region but he was taking leadership providing a socialist pole against globalization and so on alongside fidel castro of cuba um, cuba and venezuela became key reference points after the 1999 opening of the chavez government for the international left and this is another reason why they were so much a threat and this is a reason why cuba continues to face ceaseless attack and i very much hope people will seize of this view that trump has put cuba ridiculously on the state sponsor of terrorism list the real state sponsors of terrorism sit in washington dc cuba on the other hand is exporting its great asset which is human freedom uh, in the current situation cuban doctors with the henry reeve brigade out there in hot covid wards they more than anything else should be given this year's nobel peace prize so i hope very much you'll all go to the website cuba nobel uh, sign up there and 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 you know uh, campaign for the cuban doctors to get uh, the nobel peace prize now, okay so now to switch it was a threat i mean i don't even need to um, you know uh, go into the heads of officials in the united states about how threatened they felt by the events in in venezuela the development of a resource socialism the development of deepening the capacity of people the development of a new food sovereignty movement a development of um, regionalism on the bolivarian platform and then of course the reference points of international socialism being cuba and venezuela um, this was a threat in dc and because thanks to julian assange who should definitely walk out of belmarsh prison he should have never been imprisoned julian assange a great international hero the wikileaks organization we got to read the evidence of war crimes conducted by the united states government in iraq in afghanistan and so on but also through the state department cables we got to see how they from the beginning wanted to overthrow the government of hugo chavez the current attempt to overthrow the government in venezuela has nothing to do with democracy nothing to do specifically with the government of nicolas maduro nothing to do with any of that not nothing to do with so called drug trafficking great hallucination of william barr um, the attorney general of trump earlier um, nothing to do with all that this is a long term two decade long project to undermine the bolivarian revolution and it's all there in the wikileaks released state department cables one after the other those cables tell you exactly what they have in mind which is regime change now how to do the regime change in 2002 they attempted a direct coup against the government of hugo chavez um, the coup initially seemed to succeed and then the people rose up and it totally failed the coup in against the venezuelan government in 2002 is comparable to the bay of pigs invasion against the cuban revolution in 1961 there's something similar about the timing just as the revolution starts to go the united states attempts to destabilize it to overthrow the government it failed it failed in cuba in 1961 Uh, out of which came the very important organizational form of the committee to defend the revolution you had a similar thing happen in in venezuela after the failed coup in 2002 um, the bolivarian revolution deepened and people were mobilized ceaselessly to defend the gains that they had made and so on uh, this was dis, uh, this was disheartening to washington dc it was not able to overthrow the government of chavez not able to defeat the bolivarian revolution through a conventional coup 
And so you then see them move to the next kind of coup, which is the hybrid war. So I want to spend a few minutes going over how to understand a hybrid war. Um, before I get to that, I just want to introduce this webinar is produced around a book um, that I edited along with Claudia de la Cruz and Manolo de los Santos. Um, this is a book called Vivi Ramos, Venezuela versus Hybrid War. It's published by international publishers. You can get a hard copy from the team, Gary Bono and others. We're very grateful to Gary for getting this book out so quickly. Um, this book is also available as an ebook from Leftward Books, which I edit from New Delhi. Um, so please have a look at it. It's a, it's a terrific edited collection. The preface is written by Carlos Ron, who is the vice minister for North American affairs in the Venezuelan government. It's an excellent, excellent preface. So I highly recommend you go and take a look at this. Um, some of what I'll talk about in terms of hybrid war is better brought out in the book. Okay, hybrid war. I'm going to just talk about maybe four different uh, tentacles of the hybrid war um, in a long period. And uh, again, just another reference if you're interested. Um, earlier this last year, I published a book called Washington Bullets. Um, it's available in the West from Monthly Review Press. It's available in India from Leftward Books. Um, it also lays out the longer history of the hybrid war, which goes back uh, to the 1940s. So if you're interested in the longer history, take a look at Washington Bullets. If you're interested principally in the Venezuela story, uh, please look at Viviremos. And of course, I recommend that you, know, um, you lay your hands essentially on both of them. Uh, that's not a bad idea. Um, and you can get the ebooks as well. Okay, now four different aspects of the hybrid war I'd like to uh, put forward. One is information war, then the economic war, um, then the financial war, and then finally um, we'll come to, uh, you know, uh, well, uh, complicated business of, of sabotage and things like that. We'll come back to that. First, the information war. It's quite clear that um, the United States, uh, Western countries and so on, as a consequence of the longer history of imperialism and colonialism, there's a long history of the fact that it has been able to create um, information networks that are highly influential. Um, as, a, as a consequence of that colonial history, there is also a kind of racist blanket that sits over our heads. So I'm going to just give you a couple of examples of how the information war functions. You see, it's quite easy for Western media to suddenly say Manuel Noriega is a nutcase drug dealer and so on. You erase the fact that he used to work for the CIA and so on. It's easy to say Saddam Hussein, you know, is a monomaniacal killer, which, you know, is true. The Iranians will tell you that Saddam used chemical weapons against them and so on. But what will disappear from the story is it was Germany, United States and so on that provided the chemical weapons to Saddam Hussein. It will fail to tell you that it was Saudi Arabia, Kuwait and others that paid Saddam Hussein to go to war against Iran. All that disappears. Suddenly he becomes this, you know, this uh, psychotic individual. In the same way, they'll say things like Nicolas Maduro, he's a dictator or Hugo Chavez, a dictator. Uh, Evo Morales overstayed his welcome in Bolivia, things like that. And it will become the common sense of the media. People will take it for granted. Meanwhile, as you know, uh, during the 1990s, when Madeleine Albright was the, um, the US ambassador to the United Nations, she was on a program, 60 Minutes, where she was asked about a UNICEF and a UNESCO report from the UN, which showed that um, half a million Iraqi children had been killed because of US policy. This was what the report said. And rather than say, you know, we disagree with the report or I haven't seen the report, or well, it's the reason there were the killings was because of the Iraqi government. Madeleine Albright quite happily on this program said, yes, you know, that's true. We are responsible for killing half a million people, children. And she said, it's a price worth paying. That's what she said. You know, you can watch the clip on YouTube. Um, Bill Clinton will never be described as genocidal, even though his administration is responsible for at least the death of half a million Iraqi children. Uh, Muammar Gaddafi was never, ever, ever accused of anything of that scale. And yet he becomes the dictator and the you know genocidal person. Um, 
George W. Bush is responsible for the death of over a million Iraqis, perhaps more, uh, in an illegal war, a war that the head of the United Nations, um, you know, uh, called an illegal war. Um, this is Kofi Annan. Kofi Annan called the U.S. war on Iraq illegal. A million people plus killed in that war. And we don't think of George W. Bush as a genocidal maniac. No, we don't think of George W. Bush as dictatorial. He's dictatorial toward the people of Iraq or of Afghanistan. We don't see that. But we, because of information war, see and maybe take even as normal. Oh, Maduro is a problem or something like that. You see, it's a very curious way in which information warfare works. These leaders uh, in the West are seen to be uh, beyond reproach somehow. They, they don't commit crimes. In fact, after the U.S. war against uh, Libya, U.S.-French war against Libya, NATO war against Libya, um, NATO was asked to provide documentation so that there could be an after-action review. They were asked by the United Nations. NATO refused. Peter Olson, NATO's lead lawyer, said, we don't have to tell you. And besides, NATO, the United States, France, and so on, never commit war crimes. Because why? Because we are civilized. The others are always committing war crimes. This is a part of information war. This is one of the key aspects of hybrid war, the delegitimization of the government of Venezuela by painting it as authoritarian without any evidence. You know, there have been more elections in Venezuela than I can even, you know, uh, think of. And I've been and, and observed a number of them. Yet somehow, Despite the repeated fiasco in the United States over its elections, including the recent one, and then, of course, the previous one, and then, you know, Bush versus Gore and so on. Despite the repeated fiasco, they'll point the finger at Venezuela and say that election is not um, viable. Our, our elections are viable, not theirs. Our morality, their morality. It's a classic way in which information war functions. So that's the first you know, instrument of the hybrid war. Second instrument is, you know, in world history, at least in the capitalist history, there's only been two ways of reconciling trade, only two instruments. One was gold and the second has been the dollar. Even though the dollar is only covers about 50% or so of world um, reconciliation, you know, it, it stands in between two countries uh, who trade with each other, dollar still plays a fundamental role. And it's going to be difficult to go beyond the dollar. It's not something easy. You know, when two countries trade, uh, they'll trade in their own currencies if their balance of payments uh, difference is zero. Moment I start getting a balance of payment surplus i'm sitting on your currency nobody else is going to accept your currency so i'm not going to benefit from it i would prefer to trade with you in in dollars so that i can use the dollars elsewhere that's why dollar has such a grip on international trade it's very hard you can't just voluntaristically pivot away from the dollar the power of the dollar the power of of wall street gives the united states extra economic control over countries because it can you know through the fact that the United States controls the dollars to some extent, through the fact that the United States controls the banking world to, to, to some extent, through the fact that the U.S. Treasury Department plays an extraordinary role, not only over international financial systems, but also the IMF, because of all that, um, you can easily strangle a country if you place secondary and primary sanctions against them. The United States has illegal sanctions on 30 countries. I say illegal because it's against the UN Charter, um, because there's no UN uh, Security Council resolution that allows for these sanctions. But because the United States economy, because the dollar is so central to uh, world trade, it becomes hard for, for countries you know, when they get uh, sanctioned by the US. So the second instrument of the hybrid war that I want to emphasize are sanctions. Uh, sanctions are criminal, they are heartless, they are ruthless. And at a time of a pandemic, when doors should be opened for finance to allow countries to import medical equipment, vaccines, and so on, the United States is tightening sanctions against countries like Cuba, Venezuela, Iran, and so on. It is a barbaric act by the U.S. government, and I hope very much it will be contested um, and that you know you will become part of the sanctions kill movement, uh, sanctions kill movement uh, to end totally end the U.S. illegal uh, unilateral sanctions against the world. So that's the second instrument of the hybrid war that I wanted to point to. The third instrument of the hybrid war is financial systems, slightly separate from this one, which is currency and, and trade. Um, 
You see, a country needs to import things. They need to export things. They have to use financial systems. Um, you're not paying, you know, in bundles of cash and so on. You have to be able to transfer money overseas. The main inst uh, institution of such international money transfers is the SWIFT system, which sits in uh, Belgium. Uh, by the way, today, as I said, is the day of the assassination of Patrice Lumumba. He was killed by the Belgians. They have no high moral ground for anything. I mean, they haven't yet properly uh, apologized and compensated for what they did to the Congo. And yet, of course, that's the headquarters of the SWIFT system, which is where money, um, you know, it's a facility to move money around so you can pay your counterparties and so on. Well, because it's in Europe and because the Europeans are worried about US illegal sanctions, these unilateral primary and secondary sanctions, um, it's hard sometimes for the, for even sometimes SWIFT no longer wants to operate in the country. So with Iran, for instance, SWIFT stopped working. And this has been a problem for countries like Venezuela, that the financial systems are loath to deal with um, a country like Venezuela because it's under heavy sanctions. And the worst experience of that is when the Bank of London seized the legitimate gold of the Venezuelan people sitting in the coffers of the Bank of London, refused to hand it to the control, not only of Venezuela, but when Venezuela asked for it to be handed over to the United Nations Development Program to oversee purchases of medical equipment and so on, the Bank of London refused. And now in the court case, it looks like the Venezuelan government will prevail against the Bank of London, but that's an ongoing case. Um, so financial system control, uh, particularly by Washington DC and its allies in the European Union, um, is very much part of the hybrid war. It's debilitating for countries because they cannot pay even countries that are willing to trade. Um, here, of course, um, the sanctions also hurt transportation networks. Um, and again, this has got to do with finance. How do you pay a shipping company. Shipping companies worried that they will then, because of, of their, um, you know, allowing their ships to take goods to Venezuela, they will get into trouble with the US government. This is the other aspect of the hybrid war. Then um, the other one that I want to focus on a little bit is the much more direct assault on these countries. I mean, look, um, you don't even need to send your bombers to attack, you know, an electricity grid anymore you can use um, cyber warfare to basically take out an electricity grid. And Venezuela has experienced this several times. There have been sophisticated cyber attacks, sabotage attacks to take out the electrical grid. This is a very dangerous thing for a country. You know, you've got people in hospitals who are on ventilators and so on. When you're maliciously attacked, when your electricity grid is maliciously attacked, it really threatens the lives of people. This is not a, a trivial matter. You know, it's a very serious issue. And Venezuela has seen this repeatedly. Sabotage, I mean, you take the case of Iran, which has faced sabotage, again, uh, ceaselessly from the United States, from Israel. The Stuxnet net attack uh, that was made of the Atomic Energy Agency in, in Iran was, was considerable. This worm, digital worm was put into the Iranian Atomic Energy Agency computers and it wrecked the computers. It actually destroyed some of their machines. Highly sophisticated cyber attack. Of course, Iran has also seen assassinations, not only of Qasem Soleimani in Baghdad, but of nuclear scientists, heads of nuclear agencies and so on in Iran, who've been shot to death, mines put on the side of their car and so on. We've seen assassination attempt of Nicolas Maduro with a drone um, in 2019. Um, you know, we've seen the attempted invasion by these small groups of, you know, uh, paramilitary type organizations at our institute, Tricontinental. We produced a text called Corona Shock and the Hybrid War Against Venezuela. I really recommend you go and read it. It's also, by the way, reproduced in Vivi Ramos. In that text, uh, we talk about the Bay of Piglets, you know, this attack on Venezuela when a boatload of uh, U.S. trained mercenaries came from Colombia. Um, so this is the hybrid war. Uh, it's, it's significant. Now I'm going to pick up on two more aspects. This is the attempt at political destabilization and, and economic destabilization. This is, again, deepening a little bit the hybrid war concept. I hope this hybrid war concept is clear. If you go to the Tricontinental website, we have a dossier recently called Twilight, which is about the decline of U.S. authority and possibilities of multipolarity. The last section of the dossier goes over the concept of hybrid war. 
So if you if you want some more detailed exposition of it, go to thetricontinental.org and download the most recent dossier. It's called Twilight. Okay. Political destabilization. Now in 20. 17 a group of countries led by the united states from behind the scenes but canada up in front met in lima peru uh, to organize countries which at the time had right-wing governments and they created something called the lima group last week carlos ron and i wrote a piece where we essentially accused the lima group of being an illegal conspiracy it's illegal because it's against um the UN Charter, the UN Charter of 1945, which explicitly in Article 53, and we quote it in that article, explicitly in Article 53 says that this kind of thing is, is illegal because you cannot have an enforcement mechanism uh, without a UN Security Council resolution. And the Lima Group has attempted all kinds of ways to enforce its agenda, to impose its agenda on Venezuela. Its agenda on Venezuela, of course, is regime change, which is illegal. Uh, as far as the UN Charter is concerned. It also happens to be illegal based on the Organization of American States Charter of 1948. And Carlos Ron and I, in our piece last week, detail from both the UN Charter and the OAS Charter how the Lima Group, uh, led by Canada and so on, how the Lima Group is an illegal conspiracy. It's a racketeering uh, organization, in fact. But uh, this is a part of the attempt to create political destabilization. It's an instrument for political destabilization in Venezuela. So after the construction of the Lima Group, you saw this development take place from both the Lima Group, led by the Canadians, and from the United States government to just destabilize, delegitimize politics inside Venezuela. They constructed out of nowhere this character called Juan Guaido, and they said he's the new president, not the elected president, Nicolas Maduro. Uh, they manufactured a government overseas, started to try to access and seize the assets of the Venezuelan government, you know, including Citco but, and the gold in London and so on, but also embassies and say, these embassies are no more controlled by the government of Nicolas Maduro, but by this fictional Washington DC created government. At the same time, Political parties of the opposition inside Venezuela that disagreed with this strategy were sidelined. Now, I'm going to come back to them in a second. They were sidelined. So what you had was this view being pushed by Washington and the Lima group that there's no politics inside Venezuela. There's just authoritarianism. There's no politics. That Juan Guaido has to utilize F-16s and the hybrid war to come to power. You can't actually contest um, Nicolas Maduro inside Venezuela. Now, this is interesting. What this suggests is two things. One, that there is no politics inside Venezuela, that there's no opposition of any credibility. And second, that if he, even if there were an opposition, they can't defeat the government. I want to tackle both propositions one by one. Firstly, Juan Guaido is an extremist. Um, close to other extremists, such as Leopoldo Lopez and so on, um, who doesn't represent the opposing voices inside Venezuela at all. Uh, at certain times, they opportunistically came around, the, around him because they thought, well, he has a direct access to the CIA and Washington money. From 1959, after the re revolution of 1958, from 1959, till 1999 when Hugo Chavez took office, two political parties governed Venezuela one by one, two conservative right of center parties. One is called COPE, the other is called Acción Democrática. They ruled Venezuela from 1959 till 1999, unbroken between the two of them for 40 years. Since 1999, both parties continue to be in existence. They continue to fight for their agenda. Uh, I was in Caracas uh, for the National Assembly election, which was held on the 6th of December of last year, 2020. On the 5th of December, I had a meeting with others of the leaders of Acción Democrática and COPE. They said a couple of things that I want to inform you about. One, they said that they don't believe that Juan Guaido represents them at all. Secondly, they believe that Juan Guaido does the bidding of Washington, D.C., not the Venezuelan people. 
they are no longer interested in that regime change strategy from Washington and Juan Guaido. They want to build a credible Venezuelan internal opposition that contests the PSUV, the Socialist Party, from within. That was very interesting. So the first proposition is that Mr. Guaido is an irrelevant person. He, he doesn't actually command the opposition inside Venezuela. There is an opposition. The evangelical parties came to this meeting. They agreed with COPE and Acción Democrática. The liberals came to this meeting. They agreed with Acción Democrática and COPE. They no longer want Juan Guaido to be seen as the leader of anything. Uh, he is essentially a puppet of Washington, D.C., doesn't represent anything on the ground. That's the first proposition. The second proposition, that there's no politics because they can't win. Now, this has an element of truth to it. Um, despite the fact that there is this opposition, they don't actually have a program that can easily overcome the advantages of the socialist bloc of the left inside Venezuela. And that has to do with the agenda charted from 1999, the agenda of improving people's lives, building homes, um, providing food and so on. That agenda that Mr. Chavez put into place from 1999 has constructed an enormous reservoir of loyalty, of Chavismo loyalty uh, to the government. And it's very hard for Acción Democrática, COPE, the liberals, you know, Timothea Zambrano, people like that. It's very hard for them to contest the socialists because you see, they believe in privatization. They believe in corporate power. They openly talked about the importance and necessity of privatizing the economy and so on in a, in, a, in a big way. So what are they going to go to the people and argue against the socialists on? I mean, they don't have a project for Venezuela. The socialists have a project. It's rooted in Chavismo. These people are anti-Chavez. So they don't have a project. It is difficult for them on the political platform, but not because of repression. Not what Guaido is saying, it's because the agenda is limited. And that's an important feature. So they want to reconstruct the politics of Venezuela. On the 5th of January, the new National Assembly took its seat. Uh, they want to create a whole bunch of different you know, platforms, uh, commissions to study things, and they want the sanctions to end. Timothea Zambrano, who's going to head an important committee in the new National Assembly, told me directly, we must have the sanctions over. Uh, and I want people to take that seriously. There is a politics inside Venezuela. The hybrid war accusation that Venezuela is dictatorial is nonsense. It doesn't fly. So that's the first kind of destabilization I wanted to get a little deep into. And I, I want to put a little point here about the Communist Party of Venezuela which exists and in this election um, ran separately and independently. Uh, the independence of the Communist Party is part of the richness of Venezuelan politics. You know, why should everybody agree? Um, you know, just because uh, there is no agreement doesn't mean that there is no political maturity. You know, there's an advancement of the political agenda. As long as people are sincere about uh, improving the condition of people's lives, having disagreements is perfectly fine. It actually shows it demonstrates um, that there is a kind of, of rich possibility of a real um, you know, political sovereignty to be created once this sanctions and this hybrid war is set aside. A genuine political sovereignty will be crafted. The second part of hybrid war I wanted to get into a little bit was the economic destabilization. The point I made was political destabilization, now economic. I mean, here, Venezuela has been struggling with hyperinflation for a long time. This hyperinflation doesn't have to do with the, you know, the essentials of the Venezuelan economy, the fundamentals of the economy. Nothing to do with that. It doesn't even have to do with the fact that the Bolivarian Revolution inherited, uh, you know, this sort of resource trap where everything, had, you know, oil was exported, you import and then you buy exports. That was not, that's not the sole reason. The author of the economic destabilization is the sanctions. Um, as a consequence of the hybrid war, Venezuela just doesn't have the tools available for any exchange rate stabilization. Very difficult to do that. And for which it has had to, uh, you see increasingly the creeping dollarization of the country. You know, this is imposed on Venezuela by the sanctions regime. The Bolivar gets more and more eroded of value and the dollars basically uh, come in and substitute for it. It's hard to um, get your own currency back on track if you're facing such a, a deep and, and powerful uh, hybrid war. 
Secondly, you know, com companies around the world are loath to trade with Venezuela because they're afraid of the primary and secondary sanctions that are struck upon them uh, by the United States and its allies. I mean, so now, you know, the government had to deal with something very tricky. What do you do? Um, you know, you have uh, the United States saying we'll sanction all of Venezuela's state sector. The state sector was very much part of Chavismo, an important part of, of economic infrastructure of Venezuela. So large parts of important areas of human life had been brought into the public sector where they should be, like healthcare, education, and so on, was gradually brought into the public sector, taken out from uh, the law of value and profit motive. Um, but since the public sector is in toto sanctioned by the U.S. government, you know, U.S. government not only sanctioned leaders of uh, the government, they sanctioned most public institutions. You can't trade with the public institutions. So because of that and because there is a real challenge inside Venezuela, a practical challenge, the Venezuelan government passed an anti-blockade law, put an anti-blockade law forward, which has two aspects that I think bear reflection. One is there is an idea in that law that you don't have to make transparent some deals you're making with companies overseas. And this is to protect those companies because they don't want to face primary and secondary sanctions from the United States. So if you're going to survive in this difficult period of the pandemic with sanctions, with now one of your main allies, Cuba, on the state sponsor of terrorism lift list, you cloak the identities of those who are trading with you. I think this is a practical solution. Nobody in Venezuela that I talk to about this, not even the minister who's in charge of this, nobody says these are permanent policies. These are policies in the moment to deal with a very practical issue. The second thing in the anti-blockade law bears some you know, reflection is that you will see privatization of some sectors of, 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 uh, of the public sector, some areas of the public sector. This is not because privatization is being you know, pushed for itself. This is not a neoliberal strategy. This is privatization to prevent these, these companies or these sectors uh, from being, you know, facing U.S. secondary and primary sanctions. If there was no primary and secondary sanctions, there would be no need to open these companies into the private sector. But because the U.S. state has suffocated the public sector, you've got to have these, you've got to address the immediate needs of people. And th therefore, this has been an interim or short-term strategy. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding of the anti-blockade law. And I'll be happy if you'd like to answer some more questions on it. As far as I know, I don't claim to be a major expert on this. Um, this economic war has, of course, an, uh, an echo of Richard Nixon's statement he made to Henry Kissinger regarding Chile when he said, we will make the economy scream. Uh, that's exactly what the United States government is doing. It's an act of great cruelty, what the US government is doing, not only to Venezuela, but to 30 countries around the world, um, you know, Lebanon, um, Zimbabwe, Syria, uh, Iran, and so on. They face the sanctions policy, which just has to end. We need to have an international campaign against U.S. unilateral sanctions. It is one of the most criminal forms of warfare, hybrid warfare against people on the planet. Um, I just want to close with just a few thoughts, um, if that's possible, uh, and then we can have question and answers. Um, you know, it's interesting, comrades, to think about this, but ever since the October Revolution in 1917, all the revolutions have taken place in poor countries, all of them. Um, after 1917, in the Tsarist Empire, we moved 1919 to Mongolia, then we went to Vietnam, 1945, then China, 1949, then Cuba, 59. Maybe we go to Burkina Faso, 50, 83, and I'll miss a whole bunch more. But there was no revolution in Europe, uh, and there was no revolution in North America. Um, the advanced industrial countries simply didn't have a revolution. You know, Gramsci wrote an article in Avanti in 1917, December, and he said he called the Russian Revolution a revolution against capital. He meant, of course, Marx's Capital Volume 1. He said, Marx, he, he claimed, but Gramsci was wrong in this. Gr Gr Marx, he claimed, uh, had thought there would first be a revolution in an advanced industrial country where the productive forces had developed and it would come into clash with the social relations of production and then you'd have a revolution. Well, Marx, many in many of his letters says, we don't wait for the productive forces to advance. You know, that would help, but you don't wait for it. 
um, in fact marx had a much more a practical uh, understanding of this lenin developed marxism in a direction that's important lenin said in the colonized parts of the world imperialism will never allow productive forces to develop therefore in these parts of the world socialists have a very difficult agenda you have to fight to overthrow colonial relations the national liberation project you have to fight to build the productive forces so you are now forced to build productive forces and you are forced to socialize the relations of production it's a very tall order um, and this is the real tragedy of the building of socialism in the last century that in all our countries you know vietnam cuba venezuela and so on the road is very difficult and i find it amazing how north american and european leftists forever condemn the attempt in these parts of the world to build socialism based on some abstract standard you know in um, the 1960s just before he died ho chi minh welcomed a delegation of italian communists the italian communists very sincerely came to see him uh, in hanoi and they said to ho chi minh again very sincerely what do we do to help your revolution and ho chi minh said to them go home and make your revolution and i want to say to people who have an abstract understanding of socialism build your revolution the complexity of building your revolution will teach you to understand the complexity of other people's revolutionary process revolutions aren't easy to do they are difficult um socialism as linton kwesi johnson sang in a song now almost 30 years ago socialism is a wise old shepherd but you only get wise through the experience of struggle you don't get wise just by reading the theory thanks a lot thank you and now we'll this is d miles again we'll open the floor for uh questions and comments so if you'd like to introduce a question or a comment please click your raised hand icon and we will open your mic okay ismail i was about to open your mic but i see you put your hand down so i'm looking just click the picture of the hand so to indicate you want to introduce a question or raise a comment Okay, Robert, your mic is open. Uh, click, uh, put your mouse cursor. There you are. Speak up. Hello, Visa comrade. Uh, good to see you again. I have a, uh, I have a question. In light of what Nia uh, uh, Musk said, uh, he tweeted out uh, maybe about a month and a half ago to to coup Bolivia. In light of the fact that just a couple of weeks ago he surpassed Bezo as the richest man in the world, he might have dropped back then again. What, in your perspective, in your analysis of world history and socialist history, does that have in light of the fact that the oligarchies of the world are behind a lot of the mechanisms of the state? What it what as an American citizen, as a person who lives in the United States, as a leftist in the United States, what can we do specifically to either slow this mechanism down as far as the oligarchs uh, with the lithium because of the fact that the Biden administration is somewhat more, his Green New Deal does not sound is not socialistic it's very much in line with a more capitalist means of doing it and i fear that his way would be just to invade the global south for the raw minerals for the batteries for the electric vehicles so us in the global north especially the united states what can we do to try to um raise awareness and also mobilize um on a local level 
in our own communities as far as um, the, the global south and the raw, the, the rare earth minerals. I mean, they have them okay, in okay, Ireland. Okay, Robert, I think you, you, you made you. your point. Okay, thank, thank you very much. VJ, if you want to respond. Yeah. No, no, this is a very good, important question. Uh, let, let's just take it sequentially. Joe Biden will be inaugurated on the 20th of January. He's assembled a foreign policy team, which is terrifying to me. Um, his national security advisor designate Jake Sullivan told Walter Russell Mead last year um, that uh, yes, the United States wouldn't be able to invade Venezuela. He said as if that's a concession. Uh, and then he said, we are going to double down on sanctions. This is very uh, objectionable. And I think people in the United States need to organize around the sections of of um, of the legislature of the of the you know uh, of the Congress uh, who would be willing to put a bill forward uh, asking for the sanctions policy to be withdrawn. I think that the um, the group of 77 in the UN needs to put a proposal forward at the General Assembly to condemn sanctions as illegal and, and, the, and inhumane, especially now in the time of the pandemic. So I think the United States left has a serious uh, obligation to fight against the doubling down of sanctions, as Jake Sullivan put it. Um, you know, uh, I would like to also caution us that when um, Samantha Power comes into the USAID office, USAID has a long history of participating, in fact, leading in coup d'etats, uh, that you have Samantha Power who led the war against Libya, uh, now in that position. This is very chilling. And I understand when people make distinctions and say, well, you know, Biden is, is a big improvement from Trump. It depends where you're sitting. If you're sitting in Caracas, the gap between Biden and Trump might not be as wide as you think, uh, especially if they're going to double down on sanctions, as he put it or if they're going to intensify hybrid war. One of the tests of this is going to be how quickly, how swiftly uh, the Biden administration is going to reverse the state sponsor on, of terrorism uh, designation on Cuba. That should, the attempt to reverse that must start on the 20th of January. That's a test to see the seriousness of whether the Biden administration is serious about um, you know, uh, international law and so on. That's a ridiculous designation. And on the question of the Green New Deal, I'm actually uh, very skeptical of whether they will come to terms with the fact that you can't have a so-called green transition in the advanced industrial countries without batteries that rely on lithium, without um, raw materials that come from the Congo. So what happens to Bolivia? What happens to Congo? What happens to Argentina? What happens to Chile? What happens to countries when they say, look, we want um, our resources to uh, you know, advance our agenda? Will we see coup d'etats? Will the United States government, whether liberal or conservative, overthrow governments in other countries in order for a green transition? Are we going to greenwash the history of coups? Something to put on the table. And I would very much like to see the U.S. peace movement strengthened. U.S. Peace Council become a central inst instrument of, of the, the U.S. peace and justice community. Um, and I think it's no longer uh, possible just to say, let's get a, a deal on, on health insurance in the U.S. or let's work out some better relief in the U.S. unless you're fighting against militarism. You're not going to be able to finance anything inside the U.S. if they continue to spend a trillion dollars destabilizing countries around the world. Okay. Miguel, your mic is open. There you are. Uh, hello. Thank you so much for your presentation and for the book. Um, uh, my name is Miguel. I'm a uh, Communist Party member here in Chicago. Um, there are almost 60 million uh, and growing Spanish speakers in the United States, which I am one of them. And the thing that I find troubling is that we get most of our Spanish language media from uh, media outlets in Miami controlled by right wing, uh, you know, mostly Cuban and increasingly, uh, you know, very anti uh, Maduro, anti Venezuela uh, perspective. Um, and that is uh, when we talk to uh, partners who Spanish speaking and trying to organize in here, the narrative that has been ingrained in many Spanish speakers is how, you know, evil Venezuela and how that's part of our, you know, process of increasing democracy. And I find it very troubling um, so, 
and it's making it increasingly difficult. And we're seeing that the, the, the influence of uh, Spanish speakers in the United States is growing. We saw it in the elections in Florida and other parts. And we are not a monolith. I mean, there's different you know, parts. We vote for different interests to part, but yet the, the story that we're getting from media outlets in Spanish increasingly in the United States is one-sided white-wing perspective. I know there are other outlets out there like Telesur, which you know uh, have more of a balance. What 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 do you what do you think we can do here as Spanish-speaking um, progressives to help combat that perspective? It's a great question, and Miguel, I, I appreciate the way you framed it, and and I'm glad you mentioned Telesur. I, I think it's important for pe progressive people not to share um, you know things on social media from right-wing media. I think you just have to come to Telesur, ARG Medios in Argentina, AlliNet, which is for now located in Quito, Ecuador, and so on. I mean, there's, there's so much uh, progressive news coverage that comes out of Latin America um, that needs to be read, digested. Those opinions need to be seen um, you know, as shaping the narrative, not as you said, these right-wing outlets from Miami and so on that you know shouldn't be given uh, two minutes of our time. But uh, so I think one of the things that we need to do is to organize against the information war, uh, to organize against some of these outlets, to provide alternatives and so on. It, it would be interesting, Miguel, if you just made a list, um, a meme of five places to get your news and started circulating that and got you know important um, Latino left platforms to take to start a campaign uh, not to take our news from those particular right-wing outlets but to go here i think that kind of information battle of ideas um, you know uh, campaign would be very useful it's, so it's not just about this issue with sanctions or that issue with nicaragua or this issue here or the election in ecuador it's the broad question of the battle of ideas where are you getting your ideas from why are you relying there so we need to do campaigns of what you might call media literacy, but essentially opening the door, opening the window to a different place for getting your news. That itself is a political campaign. And why that's a political campaign is one of the most important instruments of the hybrid war is information warfare. And that is why to combat information warfare, we have to show people um, how news is shaped by um, these malicious outlets, which just essentially do the work of the CIA, um, they do the work of Washington, D.C. You know, we need to rethink how people are thinking about the news. This election on the 7th of February in Ecuador, for instance, you know, a friend of mine is running for the presidency from the left, Andres Arauz. Extraordinary bright person, is an economist. He worked in a in a, some capacity in the Korea government, but that's not his his real thing. His real thing is just a brilliant, lovely, sincere person. And you know, he is. He, yesterday he had the presidential debate. Did very well. He's leading in the polls. Um, and I hope against all hope, because I know dirty tricks will kick in. I very much ask all of you to help the campaign of Andres Arauz in Ecuador. He needs to win. The campaign of Veronica Mendoza in Peru, of Daniel Jadue in, in Chile. I mean, these are authentic people of the left, and we need to push their candidacy forward. There's no sense in being always hopeless about everything. Um, you know, when there is hope out there, uh, there is always hope out there, and we have to amplify that. You know, use whatever means you have to amplify it. But a campaign against information war, I think, is essential. Okay, thank you. Maria, your mic is open. Click your mic. Oh, there you are. Thank you so Please. much. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much. It's uh, an honor to listen to BJ again. I'm from Mexico and I've been uh, following your your books and your um, publishings. I just want to ask in the case of Mexico, when you are proposing the, the notion of hybrid wars, and I'm just wondering about how, um, in the terms of how it's been co-opted, you know, the whole illegal drug business and the whole violence embedded in, in organized crimes uh, since the war on, dr on drugs by the U.S. that have pretty much rendered Mexico as, as a place full of failed state territories and how the U.S. economy has um, brought together, you know, ideologies of market-driven economy and has made Mexico pretty much um, dependent or 
its development, the future development of Mexico to be eternally, you know, dependent on the United States. I don't know if you could maybe um, expand the notion of, of high rewards to the case of Mexico. Thank you so much. Um, that's a great question, Maria. By the way, it just happens that I'm I'm reading John Ross's great book um, about Mexico City. Um, uh, it's terrific because it it gives you a sense of look. Mexico is a is a is a is an important country in the hemisphere. Uh, it's a large country. It's a country of of a great history and so on. Um, and yet it's reduced by the racist rhetoric in the United States. It's reduced globally uh, to a position where it should not be. I mean, after all, look, the United States grew its own territory uh, by trouncing Mexico in a war and seizing, you know, what, a third of Mexican territory, which forms the western part of the United States. Um, that attitude to the U.S., you know, whether it's the uh, denigration of Benito Juarez onward, that attitude toward Mexico has never changed. And it's a problem that the United States has to deal with. But it's also a problem, this racist attitude to Mexico, that it's imposed on Mexico, uh, that it also imposes on the coverage of Mexico. Um, it's impossible to think of Mexico in any way around the world without seeing it through the eyes of of this sort of racist understanding. You know, Mexico is a place of poverty where people keep running across the border um, and so on and so forth. The, the thought that the trade agreement, NAFTA, almost virtually assassinated corn farming in Mexico doesn't come into the picture. All you see is, oh, people want to flee and come to the US. Maybe they don't want to come to the US. Maybe they're fleeing because you've come there to destroy their country. In the same way as people in Afghanistan, you bomb their country, then obviously they're going to leave. You know, they, they become refugees. You created refugees. Um, NAFTA created NAFTA refugees. And we just don't see it like that. You know, instead, you just think of it as some sort of endemic poverty, state failure, as you said. Um, it's not state failure refugees. These are directly NAFTA refugees uh, since 1994. And it's worthwhile coming and thinking about that. Um, but it also, as you said, uh, and I mean, I'm just amplifying what you said, this has corrupted also Mexican politics. I mean, I, I, the other day I was just r reminded of the fact that it was um, Maya's uh, death anniversary. You know, the great founder of the Cuban Communist Party, um, the lover and friend of Tina Modetti, who was assassinated uh, in Mexico City. Um, and I was I went back and I was reading things for Maya, who you know is just a formidable character. So young when he was killed. Can you imagine Mexico City. Mexico in the 10s, 20s, 30s, you know, this is a time of great revolutionary ferment and that had to be crushed. It had to be strangled. I mean, after the 1930s, there was almost a concerted strangula strangulation of its politics. So, you know, Maria, you are right. Mexico has experienced this for a very long time. And you're also right to say that there is a way in which even the Mexican elites uh, see their fortunes through Washington, D.C. They don't see it through their own country. They don't see every province's capital being as important to them as their own capital. They look from Mexico City to Washington, D.C., uh, or perhaps even to Europe. And that's a real shame. And I think um, I very much hope that the process that's opened up now, it's not perfect by any means. The process that's opened up now is going to you know, try to resolve some of these inadequacies of thinking and doing, um, and perhaps drive an agenda in Mexico uh, that will, you know, revive a genuine left-wing project. Uh, I think countries like Mexico, India, Brazil need to have a new left-wing project. Um, it's just not there. I mean, India right now, farmers have been revolting since 26th of, of, of November. And 26th of January, they will march into the city of Delhi. It's Republic Day. Um, they are part of the construction of a new project for India. Let's see where this goes. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Eric, your mic is open. Please click your mic when you're in. Eric Gordon. Eric, click your mic on your in, on your control panel. All right, sorry, Eric. Gary, your mic is open. Yes, hello, can you hear? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, what I am interested in is, you know, uh, Keith Rowley, the Prime Minister of uh, Trinidad Tobago, 
has been put under tremendous pressure by the government of the racist sociopath to, um, I don't know, denounce Venezuela, to make it more easy for Venezuelans to immigrate to Trinidad. And he's like really held the line on that, um, even though, as I see it, he's kind of like a right winger. Um, so uh, what, what, what do you know about the relationship between Trinidad and uh, Venezuela, which is, you know, although Trinidad's in the sea, it is fairly close to Venezuela. Okay, thanks, Gary. That's a great question. Um, I think it's important to for people to recognize a few things. One is that when the ALBA network was set up, that is the you know Bolivarian Alliance of the Americas, when that was set up, the Caribbean countries came um, into it uh, understanding the value of it. You know, uh, l let's remember that in the Caribbean, including British Caribbean, Spanish, French Caribbean, speaking Caribbean. Um, there was a project in the 1950s called the to construct a West Indian Federation, some sort of unity project. After all, um, these are relatively small countries. They are islands. Um, their united effort, their attempt to unify was very important for them. It failed. It didn't work. Um, some of the countries discovered oil, Venezuela, uh, Trinidad being one of them. Uh, others, you know, were one um, one commodity exporters. Jamaica was exporting bauxite, uh, you know, what is made into aluminum and so on. Um, so the West Indian Federation project didn't really, uh, you know, uh, dig roots. It could have, and it would have been a huge advance. I mean, I remember talking to the great economist, Norman Girwan of the University of the West Indies, um, you know, about 15 years ago. And Norman, who died very tragically a few years ago, Norman would say with enormous, uh, you know, care for his islands, uh, he would talk about the failed, um, you know, attempt at that federation and the kinds of things economically that could have come out of it. The kind of way in which regional trade in the islands, if they had a trading block, could have benefited them. Uh, the way in which they could have bargained with others to buy things in a combined way, you know, use their scale to increase the scale of bargaining and so on. That didn't work out. So when Alba came, there was an appetite for some sort of regionalism, which would have you know, provided them with a, a horizontal foundation, not that they would have some view imposed by Washington, D.C. Um, so they they have become stalwarts in ALBA. When you look at the ALBA network, even now, many Caribbean countries are stalwarts in Al ALBA. Secondly, uh, these countries benefited from Chavez's oil diplomacy. Um, it's not just Haiti. Haiti relied on the oil shipments coming from Venezuela. And it was really interesting because Chavez made it very clear that, look, we are not doing you any favors. In fact, we are paying back a debt that we have to many of your countries because Simon Bolivar took refuge in these islands and then came back and liberated the continent. You know, when he went into exile, he goes into exile in the Caribbean. Then he comes back. And so Chavez many times said, we are in your debt. You don't have to be indebted to us. We're just sending you oil. You sent us freedom. I think that's a really profound part of the Bolivarian project has been this sort of regionalism. So these countries have an intimate relation with the generosity of the Venezuelan project. It's going to be hard. Uh, and in fact, it was hard in Haiti when Haiti took a position against Venezuela. Um, you know, of course, oil prices not only rose, but oil was not available in, in Haiti. And the United States put a lot of pressure on Haiti. There were riots on the streets of Haiti. There were public protests um, calling for Haiti to or, go back to its position vis-a-vis -vis Venezuela. Same in Trinidad. I, I mean, I think that if the government decided to take a hard position against uh, the Bolivarian project, they would face backlash inside the country, whether right-leaning or left-leaning politicians in the Caribbean understand that there is a deep reservoir of support for the Bolivarian project for Chavismo in general. I think that's where we are. There's an enormous pressure put by the U.S. In fact, the U.S. last year or the year before last, 2019, created a platform called American Creche or Growth in the Americas, where they are using this, um, you know, delivery of, of U.S. funds to both undermine any sentiment towards Venezuela, but also China. Um, they're using this very much against China and Venezuela. It's called Growth in the Americas, or American Crash It's a policy of the U.S. State Department and, you know, other things like USAID. It's a very troubling development. Well, once again, it's to be expected from D.C., um, but 
as we've seen, as you quite rightly said, Gary, there's resistance. And that resistance is not coming from the center-right politician, but they know that the street in their countries is with Chavismo. It's very much like that in Colombia, where you know groups like Congress, Congreso de Pueblos and others, you know, they are committed to the defense of the Bolivarian project. The street is committed to the defense of the Bolivarian project. You know, for the last, uh, in 2019, again, there were mass demonstrations in Colombia against the regime change policy led by Ivan Duque uh, against the government of Venezuela. So the street in Latin America, quite considerably, is with Chavismo against U.S. imperialism. Okay, thank you. Joy, your mic is open. Please, back when you're in, there you are. Uh Thank you. May I ask two questions? Go on, please. Okay. Um, when there was a right-wing coup in Bolivia, I remember it was reported that Elizabeth Warren released a statement somewhat similar to Trump's, and this is when she was running for president. And it really surprised me because, after all, she was known for her critique of corporate behavior in this country and corporate behavior in Latin America has been as bad, if not worse. So my first question is, what did you make about that? My second question is, when the U.S. launches a hybrid war against a country, it seems that one thing that inevitably accompanies that in the U.S. domestically is this unceasing denunciation of the violation of civil rights and democratic rights that is taking place in the country that is a victim of this war. Um, and on the other hand, if I were living in a country against which such a war had been unleashed, I think I could understand why certain civil rights had to be limited in some ways in order not to be exploited by the right wing forces. So how can we sort of figure out this side of such wars? And by the way, I thought your presentation was fantastic, both the analytic framework and the amount of information you shared. So thank you. Okay, okay. thanks. Um, both very important questions. Um, just forgive me for being blunt about the first answer, but um, I think liberals like Elizabeth Warren have a limit. And their limit is that they are progressive when it comes to things like you know, the well-being of U.S. nationals and maybe even people who um, are uh, without papers in the U.S., they, that they may extend their limit that far. But generally, it's to for the well-being of U.S. nationals. But they're not anti-imperialists. Uh, they don't come out and make gestures against the extraordinary use of American power to get um, to benefit U.S. domiciled corporations and so on. They just don't do that. I mean, the career of Barack Obama demonstrates that. Mr. Obama, in his rather boring memoir called Promised Land, I mean, why would you name, if you were a progressive, why would you name a book about your country Promised Land? Why isn't it just another country on the planet? No, it's a classic American exceptional uh, nonsense that you saw in Obama's book. He writes there about the drone strikes and the kill list that he created. And he says there about the kill list that every Thursday he would go to the situation room in the White House. He would sign off on a list to kill people. They would not been tried. They're not even being charged. They didn't even know they were being charged, but he authorized their killing. This is a man who says, you know, I struggled with that because I was against the death penalty, but I was fine with killing hundreds of people. And he said in that, that the reason he found it important to do that is his chief of staff had alerted him that liberals generally should not be seen as soft on terror terrorism. Liberals should not be seen as soft on terrorism. Liberals should not be seen as soft on imperialism. I mean, these are the worst because you see, they may even believe that what they're doing is wrong, but they do it because they want power. Power is much more important than their agenda. I, I find this grotesque. Um, I found that section of Mr. Obama's memoir grotesque uh, because he said, 
liberals should not be seen as being weak on terrorism. Um, and I think that's that's terrible. That's that's terrible. There's one thing about saying, no, this is my agenda. I'm going to prosecute it. Another one saying, well, it's not exactly my agenda, but I'll do it because I don't want to be seen as being soft on terrorism. Um, you're not an ally of the people then. You're an ally of power. And, and, and therefore, you are not our ally. And on these issues, people like Elizabeth Warren, we should not be misled by them. They are not our ally. Uh, when it comes to imperialism, the Democratic Party has very few allies of the anti-imperialist movement, very few allies. You know, one might take, uh, do a kind of gymnastics to say, well, they're better than the other side. That That's all fine. I agree. I, I'm not interested in that discussion. But on some of these principled issues, they are quite happy to allow the CIA to conduct a coup overseas that benefits companies domiciled in the United States. So that's the first thing I would say. I was not surprised to see that statement. I was disgusted by it. I was disgusted by the capitulation of liberals uh, to U.S. imperialism and have been, you know, and have they have capitulated almost through the history of U.S. liberalism. There's very little gap between liberals and the CIA. Um, in fact, even the labor movement is really involved in this. In the book I wrote, uh, Washington Bullets, there's a section of how the labor movement, the, the AFL-CIO, colluded, directly participated in the coup against Chedi Jagan of Guyana, for which they earned the name not AFL-CIO, but AFL-CIA. And the AFL-CIO till this day has not publicly apologized for overthrowing the government in Guyana and in many other governments where they directly participated with the CIA to conduct a coup d'etat overseas. So I would like those of you who are involved with the AFL-CIO to take this up, to offer the people of Guyana at least a public apology for the coup, for their participation in the coup against Chedi Jagan's government. Um, on the question of democratic rights being curtailed, I think some of this is the information war. Um, which rights? Uh, what issue? What are we talking about? You know, uh, and is it extraordinary rights being, is it uh, an extraordinary act of rights being taken away? Or is it just the normal behavior of states? You know, states behave in certain ways. Um, you know, if there is an adversary of the state, somebody says, I want to overthrow the state, I'm going to do conduct armed struggle, they get arrested. Now, is their arrest the sign that their rights have been violated? Um, Leopoldo Lopez, for instance, um, in Venezuela, wanted to conduct a coup against the government and called for armed struggle. He violated the constitution in Venezuela. Therefore, the state had to act against him. Um, in the United States, you see justice done in a very parceled way. Code pink protesters inside the Capitol treated like criminals, dragged out and so on. These nutcases that went in on the what was it, 6th of, uh, of January, uh, they are helped out, uh, held, their hands held and so on, even though they killed a police officer and other people and so on. Um, justice is not, uh, you know, uh, done properly in the United States. But yet, if anybody says, I want to overthrow the government or so on, you'll be arrested. States behave in a certain way. Uh, and I think what happens is when a state behaves in a certain way, like for instance, let's say France arrests somebody who they say is a terrorist, then the cover of terrorism makes it seem like a normal arrest. And in a country like Venezuela, if Leopoldo Lopez is arrested, who is a terrorist, they'll say, oh, it's an infringement of democratic rights. So I would say we need to have some sense of how the arrest of people by a state is treated as if it is um, you know, a huge violation of, of, of civil or human rights based on what standard. So that's the first thing I would say. There's a lot of infringement of civil rights that happens in other in all kinds of countries, but somehow the information war focuses in these countries. And if you raise these other issues, you're criticized about what aboutism, meaning you don't want to talk about that arrest in Venezuela. You want you're trying to change the subject. Quite the contrary. I'm trying to say that states operate in a certain way. They arrest people if they violate the law, or whatever the nature of the state is. Um, but it's interesting that when states operate against those who have broken the law, some states get attacked for human rights violation and other states are forgiven because they are taking terrorism seriously. And I think that's part of the information war. One more question. Okay. Trent, your mic is open. Click your mic on your end. There you are. Thank you. Um, so I 
remember John Bolton back in November of 2018 made a statement about the Troika of tyranny, and we've touched on Cuba and Venezuela. I was curious how different the hybrid war against Nicaragua has been compared to Venezuela. Okay, so you start your question by saying, I remember John Bolton, and I prefer not to remember John Bolton. So there's that. Uh, um, and then you ask me a question about uh, a part of the world I actually don't know very much about. Uh, I don't actually follow Central America as closely as I should. Um, and I, I know that it's likely that the hybrid war has been similar. So not because I don't want to answer the question on Nicaragua. I just don't follow it. I haven't traveled to Nicaragua, um, you know, recently. I, I don't know enough about it. But I, I would like to just talk about El Salvador for a minute. Um, here's how the hybrid war sometimes functions. Um, El Salvador has a port area on the Pacific coast, which it was interested in having developed. It has really languished and it would be important for the economy of El Salvador, for the people's um, you know, well-being to develop that port. And people can have different opinions about environmental a way in which it should be developed or not and so on. Um, then there was a left-wing government in El Salvador. He traveled to, um, to China, cut a deal with the Chinese. Chinese were very eager to develop it as part of the Belt and Road Initiative. They gave El Salvador, what I thought was a very good deal. On the way home, the pres uh, president of El Salvador stopped in Tokyo. At the time, the premier in Tokyo was Shinzo Abe. Shinzo Abe informed the El Salvador government that you should not go with the Chinese. I'm carrying a message to you from the United States. Don't cross Washington, D.C. on this. So the government uh, comes back. They, they are in El Salvador. It's a, now a right wing government, um, but it didn't matter because even, no, sorry, the man who went to China was the right-wing president, center-right president. After the left president had signed a deal, the center-right president goes to China. On the way back, Shinzo Abe of Japan says to him, don't cut this deal. The center-right uh, head of government comes back to uh, San Salvador, and then the U.S., uh, this American crochet group, this growth in America come in and they cut a deal that the Americans will give El Salvador some money, but they have to break relations with, uh, with China. Recently, the United States government has paid Ecuador's uh, loan to China, billions of dollars of loan the United States paid so that Ecuador now has to promise not to use any Chinese telecommunications companies. And this is at the threshold of the election where Andres Arauz might win uh, in order to lock Ecuador into an anti-China position. I mean, this is the hybrid war. Uh, this is how it operates. And the US government... It's unwilling to figure out a way to vaccinate the population, to stem, break the chain of infection, spends billions of dollars basically buying up Ecuador's debt to China uh, so that then Ecuador takes a strong anti-China position. Uh, this has been, I think, very uh, parsimoniously reported in the U.S. press. Um, but these two stories, El Salvador and Ecuador, in my opinion, uh, demonstrate the global hybrid war prosecuted by Washington DC against China in this instance. But I'm, I'm sorry, I just don't know enough directly about Nicaragua and I don't want to make things up. Any summary remarks? Well, all I can say is that, you know, yes, uh, the Biden administration comes in on the 20th of January. Yes, um, I saw that he has made several comments about, um, you know, student loans, several comments about healthcare, several comments about the vaccine and about breaking the chain of the infection and so on. And I know that the progressive movement in the United States, generally um, when a uh, liberal comes to office, when a democratic, comes to, democratic president comes to office, there's a lot of demobilization. There's a lot of trying to work behind the scenes to put pressure and so on. Um, it's a big mistake when it comes to foreign policy. I really, really wish that the United States would see the growth of a robust and powerful peace movement, anti-war movement that took a side against the hybrid war. Um, you know, it's been a long time since we've seen a powerful uh, peace movement able to move the needle in Washington, D.C. Um, you know, to, to cut that military budget, there's a campaign that the U.S. Peace Council is involved in, in reducing um, the military budget, I think all these things are so important. You know, it's called Move the Money. I'd like you to go and have a look at the Move the Money campaign. 
um, so important to put pressure, put people before profit, uh, as as Gus Hall used to say, put people before profit. There is no other way. Thanks a lot.